morning, William. Rob, Joel, how are we? Feeling alright, Joel, feeling alright. Perfect size. Be very careful of what I want that off. You read that? Just make sure. Make sure it's legible. No point in me doing this thing if uh, you can't read. Not you can't read, but you know. Can't read when I'm writing on board. Back on your board. Um, I'm a big fan. Morning, Matt. Morning, Paul. There's a there's a piece of writing right here. Can you read that? Bloody connection. Zoom in a little, bring it forward. How's that? You read that a bit better? It's very legible on my side. I should be back now. Sorry. Internet's crap in this corner of the shop. SMP. Can you read it now, Matt? Morning, Bryson. Yeah, no, internet's crap. I dropped out. Maybe I should add a 101 here. Morning, Randy. Morning, back 40. Uh, and if you haven't changed your stream to 720p, uh, now is your chance to do that. Hit the settings, um, change it to 720p, because I think it's standard, comes out as 480, and it'll be easier to read this kind of stuff if you're in 720. Morning, Chaz. Remember to hit that like button on your way in. Apple for the teacher, as they say. Have we got lighting mode? Uh, well, I've got a light like directly above, right in front, so. Wait for a few more people to stack in. Then we'll get the class started. Hope you all did your homework. The exam will be at the end of the month. It counts for 50% uh, of your grade. Yeah, I think that may be because of the 60 hertz flicker of the, um, of the fluoro. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> Need to build a new forge anyway. Don't we all? Don't we all? Let me see if I can uh, improve the lighting. Sorry, just press 
circles three points there. How's that? Does that improve anyway? I haven't seen yours back 40. Multiple choice in the test. Well, it will be, there will be a multiple choice section, but there is also an essay question. Morning, Joel. Not Joe, sorry. Joe. All right, class, settle down. Settle down. I'm your uh, educator, Sam Towns. Uh, you can call me Mr. Towns. Uh, please hold your questions uh, until such time as I open the floor. Today we're discussing the building of Forge. Um, I'm glad you could all make it. Understand that it's been hard to run classes at the moment with uh, coronavirus keeping us at home. <coughs> yes, Joel, we can go to the bathroom quickly. <laughs> I'm not going to hold this for the whole time, but I thought it would be fun. Morning, Mr. Middleman. Just on time. Class is about to begin. Yeah, well, we'll discuss we'll discuss gas usage um, in a minute. So, first question. What is a forge? Uh, this sounds like a stupid question, but it's actually one that I get asked quite a bit. Uh, and it's also kind of a metaphorical question. <laughs> Don't feel hardy. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so obviously forges in our line of work are, you know, utensils used to heat material. Uh, so that we can then deform it uh, using physical effort, uh, using the plastic state of steel to move it, or copper, um, or various metals. Um, <clears throat> no talking in class. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the one thing that a forge needs to do is heat. Now... Most of us want our forges to heat efficiently, let's say. So how do we gain more efficiency out of a forge whilst maintaining, you know, a, a low cost? So that's where... Thermal efficiency, one of the most important things in a forge. How thermally efficient your forge is, is going to affect how well you can heat metal and for how long given a certain supply of gas. So today we're going to center around this term, thermal efficiency. Good morning, Mr. A. Thank you for joining us. So, <clears throat> with thermal efficiency, our main goal is to try and trap as much of the heat as we can, as we can, basically. And thermal efficiency is gained by 
one of many ways. So, for thermal efficiency, first is refractive index. We'll talk about this in a second. Second, Second is thermal mass. I'm imagining that you can uh, figure out what that is. Ah, fair enough, Mr. Wyeth. <clears throat> Third is heat inputs. And last but not least, at least for this section, is, uh, crap, I've forgotten the word, <laughs> hell of a professor, aren't they? Um, In a chamber shape. Morning, Mr. Rogers. So, all of these four. Bye, Mr. Ray. Thank you for joining us. So, all of these four points are the main ones that are going to affect the thermal efficiency of your forge. And so, therefore, it pays to take into account each of these when building a forge or buying one. Well, making your own is a real forge. That's kind of the thing. Now, does everyone have written down? <clears throat> Give you a second to take more notes if you uh, need the time. Everyone good? Morning, Mr. White North. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so. So, right, guys, I'm going to move. My, I'm going to move my classroom. This shall improve things. Unfortunately, I'm now standing in a pile of tools. Better, I suppose. Well, hopefully, our connection will be better. No, not class dismissed, Mr. Metal Man. You're not that lucky. Yes, very crappy internet this morning. I, I need a booster. Um, my booster died. So, that's all right. We've moved position. The lighting will be slightly less efficacious, but. Uh. <laughs> green screen vessel. I suppose I could use it for a green screen if I wanted to. Now recently re moistened my eraser so I can properly erase. So yeah, make sure you're on 720p. Uh, it's definitely going to assist you with uh, seeing what I'm writing on the board. Watch this in VR, that would be interesting. 
I did clean my shed, but there's a pile of my old tools sitting next to Preston that I still have yet to organize. I've got to throw some away, give some away. Right. So, sorry for the interruption, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, so, thermal efficiency, number one. Refractive index. What is it? Thanks for dropping in, Mr. Norton. <clears throat> so, refractive index. What is it? Refractive index is the ability of a material to refract heat and light. Um, because uh, heat is normally displayed as light, uh, because of the energy. Um, you're ending, you can end up with a higher refractive index for something that re reflects light over something that reflects heat, if that makes any sense. For instance, uh, a white uh, piece of material has a higher refractive index than a black piece of material. Uh, this basically means the amount of heat that the item absorbs versus the amount of heat that the item reflects. Uh, it's the reason that most of uh, your thermal blankets and stuff like that that you put over yourself are made of a reflective material, and that's because they refract most of the heat that comes in contact with them, whereas a white uh, thing, for instance, will refract quite a bit, but not as much as uh, a reflective material because that white is still gathering some of the heat, some of the energy. Um, if you were to put a mirror underneath a heat lamp and a piece of uh, steel with some white paint on it uh, under a heat lamp, the white painted steel would get hotter than the mirror would. And very much like uh, if you put white painted steel under a heat lamp with black painted steel, the black painted steel will get hotter because it has a lower refractive index. Hopefully you're all writing this down. So, our refractive index, um, there are various measurements um, of refractive index, uh, and I'm not sure of the uh, exact um, metric that they use, uh, the, the word that they use to measure refractive index. But basically, A very simple idea. Better. <laughs> the higher the ref uh, the higher refractive index, the better for a forge. So, uh, Mr. Wyeth points out very well that uh, a very light colored kale wool um, is also go is going to be better than a dark colored. Um, forge brick. And the lighter colored forge bricks will normally be better than the darker colored forge bricks. Well, we'll get to forge bricks in a minute, but like I said, a lighter colored forge brick is going to be better than a darker colored forge brick because refractive index is reflectivity, if you think of it as reflecting. So the brighter something is under light, the more refractive it is. Now refractive index in the terms of the forge is its ability to refract heat, which comes into our second point. I've already forgotten the, the order in which I wrote <laughs> the points. I am a terrible teacher. I should have scripted this. But refractive index is directly affected by can anyone fill the blank for me? Morning, evening, Mr. Wiley. Bullet points will help. Yes, they will. So, number two, refractive index. In a forge, refractive index is not the most important, but is directly 
in alignment with the last. Morning, Mr. Coffey. Thank you for joining us. Pardon me. So, thermal mass is directly correlated with refractive index. Very good, Mr. Craftworks. So, thermal mass is a very simple idea. Thermal mass Having a fine morning, Mr. Coffey. Yeah, so the higher the mass, the more energy is required to heat it. Right? So if you have something that is, has a high refractive index, but also has a high thermal mass, then you're going to have something that reflects a lot of heat, but also retains a lot of heat. Now, the, in an ideal world, you would have something that has a super high refractive index, but also has a fairly high thermal mass. The reason for that is because a super high refractive index would mean that you, for every, let's use a, a unit of measurement, for every 100 heat that you get, if you were to absorb 99 of that heat and only reflect one of that heat, so from out of every 100 degrees, for instance, you only reflect one degree of heat and all of the rest of it is absorbed, um, which we'll talk in degrees, but that's not actually how heat works. Uh, <laughs> so, the reason that you want a high thermal mass and a high refractive index is so that you, the refractive index allows the forge to uh, throw that heat back into the chamber to heat the work, right? The refractive index being high is incredibly important because all of the heat that is refracted or reflected from the walls is going to directly heat the piece that's inside the forge body. The thermal mass, on the other hand, allows that forge to retain heat upon cooling. So if you have a high thermal mass, you're able to hold on to that heat and for annealing and stuff like that, that is incredibly important. But in general terms, Low mass equals high refraction. And this is something that uh, you will tend to find in uh, forge building when you try forge building for yourself, is that the lighter the item that you are using to build your forge, the more refraction you get, right? So if you use very low density fire bricks, then you're going to get a very high refractive index, right? But if you use high density refractive bricks, you're going to get a higher thermal mass, but lower refraction. Now, I wonder if anyone can tell me which of those two is more important in the scheme of things. Now, given that we've discussed the difference between thermal mass and refractive index, I'm imagining that some of you will have worked out which one is more important, given the topic. I'll give you a second to answer.
Well, um, Joe, Mr. Soggy Bottom, uh, actually is correct. The more important of the two, over thermal mass and refractive index, is the refractive index. Why is the refractive index more important than our thermal mass? Morning, Mr. Bobby. <sighs> Better late than never, I suppose. Exactly, Mr. Westfall's Forge. Alright, because number three is... I can't remember. Uh, wow, why am I forgetting? Yeah, but... Yeah, so, in the end, uh, I'm not going to do point number three, because I've forgotten what point number three was. <laughs> I'm very good at forgetting things, even while I'm talking about them. I really should have scripted this. I will script the next class, promise. So... If you have a forge body, let's say it's a round forge. And you have a high thermal mass. So let's say this is all high density cast refractory. Right? It has a very high thermal mass. Doesn't really matter what angle the burner is. Let's just, uh, let's just make it a vertical burner. If we have a very high thermal mass, then remember, the higher the thermal mass, the lower the refractive index, generally. Right, so when our heat comes in, all of that heat is going to be distributed into the thermal mass of the forge and radiated out. Right, because thermal mass traps heat and then expels it, and it expels it in all directions. So, if you are heating from one side, all of the thermal efficiency that you're getting is being expelled out the other side. Because, obviously, uh, hot doesn't, you know, cooler does not go to hot, cooler goes to cooler. So, you know, like, the, the uh, heat always travels from, it's, it's the uh, first and second law of thermodynamics. Uh, does anyone know the first and second law of thermodynamics? So, the first law of thermodynamics. <laughs> We're getting really deep in this. I'm sure everyone remembers the term thermal efficiency at this point. Should be taking notes. You can always go back and rewatch. There's actually a song by one of my favorite ba uh, one of my favorite comedic duos, Flanders and Swan, from back in the old days, that talks about the first and second law of thermodynamics. Laws of thermodynamics. The laws of conservation, indeed. So, the first is that heat is work, and work is heat. 
It's a very simple, this is a very simple, you know, it's not actually the, word, the wording of the first law of thermodynamics. But this is an easy way to think of it. Heat, when heated, an item begins to vibrate. That's the whole reason that, uh, you know, things glow is because of the vibration of the atoms that are inside it, right? So heat is work because the more heat there is in a piece, the more vibration is happening. And work is heat. So if you are to work something, uh, for, in, for instance, if you were to take a bar of uh, quarter inch or uh, six millimeter mild steel, and you would have bend that back and forth quite quickly, working it as you would, then feel the point of bend, right? Then you're going to feel that that is heated up. And that's because you're creating friction in the joint uh, between the atoms, between the molecules. And so therefore, the heat that you put into a piece is creating work because it's heating, is creating uh, vibrations in the molecules. But work is also heat, which is why when you hit a piece of steel with a hammer, uh, and you heat it fast, you hit it fast and you hit it hard, then you will heat up the material, right? Heat is work, work is heat. Second law, thermodynamics, we're not going to get into all the laws of thermodynamics, is cool cannot pass too hot. Right? That is the whole idea of the second law of thermodynamics. You can't pass heat from a cooler to a hotter. Morning, Mr. Fontanini. This <laughs> is a big word for this early in the morning. Well, toughen up. Welcome back to school. Right, so you can't pass heat from cool to hot. Much like you can't pass low pressure to a high pressure zone, you can't pass cool to hot. Pretty simple, two laws of thermodynamics. Interesting, yes. Useful, incredibly. Right, so we'll go back to our little sketch. In this case, I'm going to draw two. Draw them a little bigger this time. This is purely representative. We'll get into construction theory in a minute. You need to understand why a certain construction will work before we can talk about construction. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Wiley. So, on the left, we have high density, right? So, this is all high density refractory. And as you should be able to figure out by now, high density. Right, so a high density forge has high thermal mass and a low refractive index. There is a third, a third part, I'm trying to hold on to the chalk at the same time. There is a third part to this. Not high.
Something we haven't discussed yet. Long life. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. So, high density refractory. It has two pros and a con. Let's we're we're simplifying this. This is Forge Theory 101 after all. So, high density, a uh, high density forge. Uh, whether this be brick or refractory cement, uh, we're just drawing around because it's easier at this point. I'm not trying to be really super accurate with my forge construction yet. A high density refractory build is going to have a high thermal mass and low refractive index, but it's going to have high longevity. And the reason for that is because the higher the density of material, normally the higher the hardness. Right? And this is not always true of all materials, but when we're talking about refractive cement specifically, then we are going to have a higher hardness. Sorry if that's terrible writing is hard to read. You get what I mean. High hardness, high density is going to have a high thermal mass and a low refractive index. Right? Hopefully that's not easy to understand. So what does this mean for our forge? Well, what it means is, we're going to simplify this. People know that uh, heat is measured in BTUs. Uh, hopefully you know what uh, BTU is, but we can also use calories, uh, if that would be easier. Ah, uh, Mr. Dragonwater, yes, you are late. Please take your seat. Morning, Curtis. So, we have our high-density refractory. What does this mean for our forge? Uh, would you like me to use BTUs or would you like me to use calories? Just a uh, you know, quick question for the uh, students. Make it easy for you to understand. There are two chickens in the corner. <laughs> they've, come to, they've come to view the class. They're interested in learning about forge thermal efficiency. BTUs. Okay, so... It doesn't really matter, but let's say for every 10 BTUs, you lose 5 goes into the lining. So you get half your thermal efficiency. Now this is very, very simplified. The higher the density, the lower this number is going to be. Right? So for every 10 BTUs of heat that go in, only 5 BTUs of heat are going to be refracted. Right? So, you're going to have, you know, say you're trying to heat this to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to do that, you are going to have to do twice the amount, uh, use twice the amount of propane, twice the amount of uh, LPG, to provide the same result. Right? Because half of your BTUs of heat are being soaked up by the thermal mass in that material. So, ten BTUs comes in, five BTUs get soaked up and radiated out. And all of this there is useless energy. So if you imagine that you require one liter of fuel, and this is way not true, but like we're not using direct science here, but say you were to use one liter of fuel for every 10 BTUs of heat, and that's, that's really low. <laughs> that's not actually what happens. But uh, it, for, for representation's sake, for one liter of fuel for every 10 BTUs of heat, in order to get five BTUs of here in here, you're going to have to use a liter of fuel. Now, 
If we have a one-to-one, -one, right? So if we have a one, I'll put a one on there. If we have one as our refractive index, right? So this is our low density. Right, which means low thermal mass. We all remember that low thermal mass means high refraction. Low thermal mass, high refraction. Right, we all remember this, but as a con, we also have short life. Right, so our low density, if we put in 10 BTUs of heat, and there's no such thing as a refractive index of one, uh, it'll actually be more like uh, 0.9. Let's, let's say 90% efficiency, right, for, for argument's sake. 0.9. fuel efficiency, or BTU efficiency. So only 1% is getting rated out. Or 10% is getting radiated out. So instead of 50%, 10%. So... For with <laughs> for low density frame. Uh, we're getting to forge construction, Mr. Curtis. Please don't, uh, you know, please don't overshoot the class. I understand that you're very intelligent. But for every 10 BTUs of heat that are put in, we're going to have 10% lost. So one BTU of heat lost through the forge lining because we have a low density forge. But 0.9, so 90%, is going to go straight back into our chamber to heat the work. Right? So this is, this is like the ideal. There's no such thing as perfect refractive material. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there may be um, perfect refractive material. Um, hello, Mr. Burrell. A 9 kilo bus bottle forge is actually a very good forge, and uh, I will talk about that in a second. Moving ahead a little fast. Would you like to teach the class? <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm staying in character. You're stuck with Professor Towns for today. Okay, so do we all understand this? For a high density, right? We have, I'm going to put this back up on the board for those people who want to reread later. High density, whoops, I'm dropping my Wow, that was loud. Rip headphone users. Um, so, So, do we all understand this? Yes, if anyone wants a, a deeper thing, we'll, we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> For right now, Mr. Strike, we're uh, talking about um, gas forges uh, only at the moment. All right, Mr. Farmer, thank you very much for joining us. Sorry, you can freeze frame on this if you like to, to take down notes. Although some of this, uh, some of the earlier that we were talking about, is going to help you. Should probably change the title to uh, to you know, let's let's change the title while we're here. All right. Gas forge theory 101. <laughs> okay, so we now understand 
that. A low density forge is going to be more thermally efficient, and there's that word again, thermal efficiency. A low density forge is going to be more thermally efficient than a high density forge. And that is because of our refractive index. Uh, actually, yes, that is a very good question, uh, Mr. Metalman. Um, yes, technically. Um, as a material heats up, right, its refractive index increases. Uh, especially when it goes beyond IR light. So once it starts reflecting light um, through its surface being uh, so hot that it's actually glowing, um, its refractive index increases. So the, the main thing is, is um, thermal efficiency doesn't come down to permanent. It's not perpetual, right? So um, we're not talking about the laws of thermodynamics anymore. We all know the laws of thermodynamics now, I hope. And for those of you who didn't know, the second law of thermodynamics is otherwise known as entropy. It is what is going to destroy the universe. So, with a high density forge, right, you can run a uh, high efficiency out of a high, high density forge. The thing is that you're required to input enough heat to get its refractive index to a higher per point. And you're always going to believe, uh, you're always going to bleed energy out of the material that you're heating, right? So my forge, for instance, um, which we may, I may actually take you over there and, and take a look at it in a minute, um, once we've finished the theory side of things. Uh, is much less thermally efficient because of its high density, it gives off a lot of that heat. And as it bleeds heat, right, you need to continue to put more heat into it in order to maintain that high refractive index. Um, so this all comes down to heating time, right? So... Most of us who run a gas forge will know what heating time is, right? Uh, for instance, if you have a forge that takes 45 minutes to get up to heat, that's because you have a very low thermal efficiency in your forge. Yeah, so you have low thermal efficiency in your forge, much like mine. Uh, mine takes about half a bottle to get up to welding temperature, and then I need to switch bottles before the bottle freezes over so that I can actually continue to forge well. <laughs> So, heating time is going to directly affect things. The big thing is, is that this is all coming down to that favorite phrase of mine. Um, I, I don't have enough room. I'm a dumbass. Hold on a second. So, I'm going to leave this at the top of the board because I'm going to keep pointing to it. Thermal efficiency. Yeah, it's, it's expensive. And this is the thing, is that thermal efficiency is all about getting more bang for your buck, more, uh, more time forging for the money. So, thermal efficiency is incredibly important. When we talk about heating time, right, the higher the density, the longer the heating time because normally the lower the refractive index. The higher the refractive index, the lower your heating time is going to be, especially because normally you've got a lower mass. Uh, there, is a, there is a thought experiment in, um, 
in thermodynamics and, and in thermal uh, physics that was to say, if you had a cube, a solid cube of tungsten with a void in the center in which there was an element that heated, uh, you know, a, a, sorry, a hairdryer, right? If you were running a hairdryer in a fully sealed, um, a fully sealed th uh, tungsten cube, you would eventually be able to melt the tungsten cube from the inside out using that heating from a hairdryer because you're constantly increasing the heat because the, basically the uh, hairdryer would be recycling the heated air uh, that it already has um, and then it's just a constant you know, upcycle and, th and um, tungsten is actually quite thermally efficient. So um, anyway, thermal efficiency, very important. At the end of the day, so what we want is Low density. And high refraction. Right? Those two things, as far as our materials are concerned, yeah, mass equals bad. Basically, yes. We want thermal, low density, and high refraction. Although, a low mass item that doesn't have any high refraction doesn't have high refraction is practically useless. Uh, let's say, for instance, this nitrile glove, right? Incredibly low mass but incredibly low reflective index. All right, so, low density, high refraction. And, High heat resistance. Yeah, it was an old glove. It's fine. <laughs> high heat resistance is incredibly important. Right? So, we got these three points. Low density, high refractive index, high heat resistance. Now let's get into what actual materials... And then throw it away, Joel, or use it as a lapping compound. Right, so let's talk about some materials. <laughs> and Sam don't sound like it. Yeah, no, I didn't burn it down. It's, it was a glove. Right, so let's talk about refractory materials. We have Kale and ISO wool. Kale wool is actually a brand, ISO wool is actually a brand. All it is is ceramic fiber blanket, right? And we have refractory bricks. Okay, so Mr. Strike, uh, we're talking about refractory refractive index is the ability to reflect heat. Heat resistance is the ability of the material to withstand heat. Um, for instance, uh, a, a plastic mirror, right? If you were to take a plastic mirror, it has a high refractive index, but it has a very low heat resistance, right? If you were to put a blowtorch to a plastic mirror, 
it would just melt, right? Because even though it has a reflective surface, which is technically refractive, it has very low heat resistance. So therefore any heat absorbed is just going to deteriorate the material. So that's about more about the material than about its you know, inherent heating abilities. That's why we use refractory bricks, right? Now refractory, it's funny because refractory refers to, in the, in the kiln industry and stuff like that, refers to heat resistance more than heat reflection. Right, um, uh, but as we've already discussed, heat. Um, once you have a heat-resistant material, the lower the density, the higher the refractive index. Which is why In the kiln building industry, both of these are refractory, right? This is solid fired clay, right? It weighs about, uh, I don't know, five kilos. Um, this is a um, isolite uh, K26 refractory brick. And this chunk, which is about half the size, is also about a tenth of the weight, right? Both of them are refractory, according to the kiln industry, because they have uh, the ability to withstand heat. But this one, being much lighter in color and also lighter in density, has a much higher refractive index than this thing. And the reason that these are more expensive, to answer one of my students' questions, um, <clears throat> is because if you notice, when you look at a K26 fabric, there are a lot of air holes, right, in order to lower that density. In order to get this air hole filled brick uniform and, you know, cast properly, it requires quite a bit of technology, which means that uh, it means that you get a, a much higher refractive index, but it's very difficult to do. If you imagine trying to aerate something while it's hardening, it's a massive pain in the butt. Uh, actually, no. Kaowul is high refractory index, high refractive index, uh, low density, and high heat resistance. It has a higher refractive index. <clears throat> Different materials as well. Yeah, I mean the the the, the this is has a ceramic um, ceramic stuff that's actually very, very heat resistant. Yeah, it would like a marshmallow, something like that. <laughs> it's not quite like that, but yes, something like that. Um, so, we have Kale Wall, Iso Wall, and Refractory Bricks, and there are various grades thereof. There is high density Kale Wall, right? So Kale Wall, uh, Ceramic Fiber Blanket, um, as it's actually, what it actually is. Kaowul's actually a, a brand. Um, ceramic fiber blanket can have high density and low density and can also have high and low uh, heat resistance. If you go to a kiln manufacturer and buy and just ask, hey, can I have some low density refractory bricks? They will ask you what kind? <laughs> Because there are low density refractory bricks that are labeled and K actually refers to their um, heat resistance, right? So this is a K26. It's rated to 2600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if it's a lower number, then that means it's less heat resistant, which means it will degrade under heat. And that's the big thing, is that the heat degradation. Um, so yeah, when buying refractory bricks, Make sure you're asking for the high temperature stuff. Same goes with K wool and iso wool, ceramic fiber. There are ceramic fiber blankets that are rated to 1200 degrees Celsius. There are ceramic fiber blankets that are rated to 2000 degrees Celsius. I normally buy um, 1400, which is the highest that you can get uh, locally here. Yeah, so um, we, we get, we're getting to the forged construction. Yeah, stop jumping ahead of me, Jesus. We're still discussing actual materials, all right? 
So both KO wall or ceramic file breaker and refractory bricks can have um, high density and low density variants uh, with high and low refractive indexes as uh, they go up and down in density. You also have um, the ability of a low density refractory brick to be have a lower uh, heat resistance. Um, uh, lower heat resistance. Hebel blocks are a great example of a low density brick that has a low heat resistance um, but has a, a decent refractive index. Um, Hebel blocks can break down quite badly under uh, under heat. They can also explode if they're uh, improperly manufactured because Hebel blocks aren't actually manufactured for heat resistance. They do, but they're basically concrete, so you've got to be careful. You can build a forge out of fired clay bricks. Make sure they're fired clay bricks. Um, the you know the big red uh, solid fired clay bricks. If you don't use the big red solid ones, they may not be fired clay and you may just have them explode on you. Uh, yes, explode because of trapped moisture um, in the material. Uh, and also um, violent degradation of the constituent parts, much like um, plaster of Paris, blast certain heat can actually violently degrade into um, gypsum and sulfur dioxide, which can kill you. Um, so, be careful. Um, while you can build a forge out of clay bricks like this, they're going to have a very high uh, thermal mass, which means that they're going to soak up a lot of heat before they start reflecting. And they've also got a very low refractive index, which means they're going to soak up a lot of that heat very quickly, which means that you're not going to heat your uh, forge body very quickly. Uh, because they're darkly coloured and because they have uh, porosity in the, the surface that allows them to trap stuff. On <laughs> today's video, I try and explode bricks. Please don't, it's dangerous. So, these are two forms of refractory materials. We also have... Refractory cement. Right, and this comes in many forms. Yeah, bricks bricks can pop. They can also explode pretty violently. So, refractory cement comes in many forms. You can find it as satanite. You can find it as medium density, low density, high density refractory, um, castable refractory. The castable refractories and um, and paintable refractories and all that kind of stuff. Refractory cement comes in so many forms, but you will normally buy it as refractory cement or refractory mortar. The difference between refractory cement and refractory mortar is that mortar is designed to hold bricks together. So don't use mortar as cement because it doesn't work that way. Uh, mortar will tend to have a lower heat resistance. Remember heat resistance not being refractive index or thermal mass. Heat resistance is the ability of the material to resist degrading at heat. So. Uh, if refractory cement is what you want to go for, and again, it's differently thermally rated. So go for the highest thermally rated stuff you can get um, as far as heat resistance goes. Uh, for instance, satanite, I believe, is, can be um, rated to 2100 degrees Fahrenheit or um, for 26, I believe. Um, So yeah, kiln repair cement, uh, yeah, so kiln repair cement will be some form of uh, refractory cement, just make sure it's high temperature rated. Um, so these are going to be the three main things that you're going to buy as a forge builder for a gas forge, where again, we're talking gas forge theory today. Uh, I may do a, a, a thermal theory another day, but we're talking about gas forges. So, KO ISO wall. Refractory bricks and refractory cement are in this order for a specific reason, and I'm sure people can guess as to what this reason is, and it is, and I'm going to try and write this sideways while standing up normally. How? <laughs> that, that wasn't too bad, it kind of curves, but yeah, there you go. 
Density. Exactly, low to high. Um, now, that's not always true, obviously. Um, you can have high density ice to wall that is higher density than the lightest refractory brick. And you can have light, uh, low density refractory cement, which is lighter than um, some of the refractory bricks. So there is a little bit of kind of um, variance, but normally that is going to be your um, kind of your scale. Um, so if you're looking for um, heat resistance, just basically go for the highest you can. I normally build mine to withstand 1400 degrees Celsius. Um, the reason that I go to 1400 degrees Celsius is because it's the most reasonable, uh, it's the most easy to find locally. You can get higher, but it tends to be a, um, tends to be a specialist item. Uh, you know, that's uh, parrots. Uh, 28s, they're in my chicken coop right now. Um, but anyway, so yeah, uh, a lot of the time you're going to be able to get 1400 or 2600 degrees Fahrenheit um, materials like this K26 fabric. Um, I love these, by the way. That's a uh, 28 parrot. Um, we have lots of parrots. So yeah, these are your three ones. You're going to go down in density. Remember, the higher the density, the lower the refractive index, the higher the thermal mass. You keep coming back to that. Okay, let's actually go into point number four. I can't remember what point number three was now. I'm gonna have to go back and watch and go, oh, I was an idiot, I forgot that. But anyway, um, let's go into point number three, four because that's why you're all here anyway. You don't wanna to listen to me talk about thermodynamics and, and thermal efficiency and stuff, although it's really important. I know it's boring. Let's get into building a forge. Because internal chamber proportions is incredibly important. Internal chamber dimensions, internal chamber, basically the internal chamber. Okay, so normally uh, the question I get asked is square forge or round forge? All right, that's normally the two questions I get asked. There is a third option. There are many options. I mean, you can have a, uh, a house forge, which is something like this. Uh, you can also have a post box forge, which I built one recently, and you can watch the live stream of me building it. Um, this one's square like that. This one's round like that. This one's flat on the bottom and curved like that. There are various sizes of forge, right? Now, which one of these is best? Matt Wyeth pretty much has the idea. It doesn't really matter which, except when it comes to purpose. Um, it doesn't actually really matter which, when it, except when it comes to purpose. Now, why would you build a post box forge? Why would we build one of these? Let's cut it in half and look at the inside diameter. So we have our two sides. We have our forge floor. We normally have a removable lid, so it normally sits over like that. Comes over like that. That's 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 terrible, Sam. Thank you. So this is our post box forge. The burner is going to come in at the bottom. All right? But our chamber is up here. Does the post box forge need to be round or square? I'm really interested to see if people can answer this one correctly. Does this need to be round or does it need to be square?
<laughs> he rises like Batman. While he's got it, doesn't matter. It does not matter whether your forge is round or whether your forge is square. <laughs> doesn't matter because you can create a you can create a vortex. That is a terrible square. I can create a vortex in a square. I put my burner in at an angle. Flame shoots in this way. Where's it going to go? In a square. Where's it going to go? Is it going to hit the corner and then stop? It's just going <laughs> to go there and stop. Nope. Because air is not square. Heat travels in a circle. It's going to bounce. There you go. You have a vortex in a square. In a square. While having a circle, thinks you know it looks like it makes sense, you know, because it it helps the the flame travel around the outside. Right, that looks like it makes more sense, but this still works. So if all you have is a square body, you're not in trouble. You're you're fine. All right, so we have our forge burner canted to create a vortex. We don't need to, and this is another important thing. You don't need a vortex in a post box forge. Ah, damn, I just broke my chalk. Oh, I need it. Right, why do we not need uh, a vortex in a post box forge? Now, vortexes can be useful if we're making a, um, <laughs> we may be thinking of um, using it as a foundry, in which case we're going to be putting something in the center here, right? So if this is looking from the top down, we may put a crucible in the center of our forge and therefore having the flame go all the way around it, chalk tongues, yes, this is true. Uh, <laughs> Other than, the, you know, having the flame go around it makes sense because you'll be heating from all sides. In this case, flame's going to be down here. Right? All that's going to be coming here is the main heat traveling upwards. Because, as Mr. Craftworks pointed out, heat rises. Square body is indeed easier to store refractory, and we're going to get to that in a minute. So, we have a post box forge. We don't necessarily need a canted burner unless we're planning on using it as a foundry, because all we need to do is heat the bottom chamber. Now, there's going to be a line here, right? It's an invisible line, but there's a line. The reason that there's a line there is because this is where the oxidizing flame is going to be, right? This is where all of your oxygen is burning off because you have either a, a forced air or you have a venturi, right? Maybe you have a venturi, maybe you have a forced air burner. At the end of the day, you're going to do you're going to do um, you're going to end up with air coming in here to oxidize the LPG or the propane to then burn the material. I understand that, Bobby, but when you're talking about forge heats, it's not actually that important, especially in the uh, cross sections we're talking about. As like HVAC, you're talking about uh, you know vast pipe works and, and stuff like that. We're talking about a body that may be this big, right? You're not actually going to be um, creating as many convection currents as you need to really affect the problem when it comes to forge building. The main reason that, that round body forges are built a lot is because uh, it's actually easier to line with kale wool and it's also um, it's just what people have, the LPG tanks and stuff like that. You normally have round forge bodies quite easily, whereas you have to fabricate um, a square body normally. Um, but yeah, he, I mean, he's right. Like uh, convection currents and stuff like that work better in round bodies than they do in square bodies. And if I'm creating one where I definitely want to create a convection current, and I'm trying to maximize the efficiency of it, 
I'm going to use a circle, right? Like if in a foundry, I have a Devil Forge foundry. Um, in a foundry, it's incredibly important because we're trying to optimize for this. Um, <clears throat> that's exactly right, Mr. Bergman. Thank you very much. So if we're optimizing for a specific purpose, like a foundry, then we can worry about perfect efficiency, right? Use of perfect use of space. But in the scheme of forging, not important. Absolutely not important. Now, we've heated our air here, we've heated our, you know, we've heated our space here with an oxidizing flame because we've got the oxygen coming in from our blower or our venturi coming in, creating that flame. All of that oxygen is then being burnt off and so this entire chamber here, provided we're doing our job right, is going to be oxygen free. Especially if we use small forge doors, which is most post box forges have. This gives us the advantage of having a neutral environment in which to forge weld. And because our material, again coming back to thermal mass, if you're talking about a billet of... Oh, that didn't work. If we're talking about a billet of Damascus, right? If it sits on a forge floor, you're not heating this. You're heating this, right? In a post box forge, you remove that. You may have, or you will have a handle welded on, right? But your piece is going to be sitting in open air with the heat below it, right? Which means that you're getting all over connection with the heating apparatus without having any other heat sink like a forge floor stuck on the, um, stuck onto the billet, which means it's going to be sucking heat from it. Uh, of course, once the forge is completely up to temperature, that's not as much of a deal, big deal, but it is something to take into account when it comes to thermal efficiency. For Damascus, the best thermal efficiency you can have is in a post box forge. But the disadvantage of a post box forge is that there's nothing to lie your work on. So if you're trying to make a hammer, for instance, or if you're trying to work on small leaves or multiple pieces at once, then having a piece hanging out in the air is not possible. You need to sit it on a floor, which is something I'm running into at the moment because I'm making a lot of hammers and scissors and stuff like that. I can't just hang them out in the middle of the uh, post box. I have to sit them on the floor of the forge. And that's where standard gas forges come in. Oh, you're very late, Damascus. Disappointed. Don't be late again. Damascus don't need no reason. Hello, Mr. Donut. This guy was zapping the ground. Fair enough. I, I will. I will take that excuse. Yeah. So, Postbox Forge is a kind of a two-trick pony. It's really good for blades, and it's really good for Damascus. It's really good for blades because you have all over connection with the piece, and you can pass through uh, quite a large piece, um, like swords and stuff like that. But it is very, uh, very job oriented. It's very job specific. Now, we come to the argument of square body forge versus, this is kind of a rectangular body forge versus circular forge, canted burner versus vertical burner versus 90 degree burner. What's the best? There is no best. I, I, yeah, problem solved. None of these are the best. <laughs> But there are specific advantages to each of these, right? We've already established that the uh, <clears throat> we've already established the hierarchy of density and the hierarchy of thermal efficiency. In a circular forge, you could potentially line it with bricks. Right? You could take an entire friggin' week to cut each brick 
at the specific angle needed uh, for the depth of brick to make a brick circular forge, right? And actually this idea is where house forges come from. Well, what I call house forges. They're like hut forges. That's fucking terrible. That's better. This is where the house forges come in because they are normally brick made. They're not normally ISO wall made. I actually have a friend of mine, Jake Mantell from Five Pants Fabrication, who made a big forge called the Beehive, which was house forge. I've made a chalkboard, funnily enough. It's a piece of MDF painted with chalkboard. Um, yeah, it's, it's exactly the same um, idea as a bread oven. You're gaining the advantage of the curved roof, uh, whether that's an advantage or not. Uh, you don't necessarily need a ribbon burner in this. Like, if ribbon burners are great, but they're not the be-all and end-all. Um, you gain the advantage of having the curved roof, which makes it easier to mount a canted burner. And that's one of the main advantages of a round forge, the ability to mount a canted burner. In a brick forge, it, you can't really mount it on the corner. You could, you could, you could cut it in and stuff like that. But normally you'd end up having to cut an angled hole, right, in the top of your forge in order to get a canted burner in a square forge, this one. <clears throat> the main advantage of this one is that I can make a, a square forge which is literally four bricks. Just those two, those two. There you go. Right? You can take four of these K26 bricks, stack them together, and you have a forge. Fantastic. Done. That is one of the main advantages of the square forge. And brick forges are incredibly useful because they're easy to replace the lining. A K-wall forge or a round forge, normally a round forge is going to have K-wall, ISO wall, ceramic by a fiber blanket, whatever you want to call it. That is going to be the preferred method. And it's very easy to line a round forge with K-wall because all you have to do is just squish it in there. Yes, exactly right, Fred. And that's pretty much the same th sort of idea as this forge. Whenever you put, uh, so you know, you have your forge floor down here, you have your, your piece, you have equidistance from the uh, surfaces, but of course you lose that advantage by having the, um... yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can't put the bread in there for very long. Although it will create a carbonizing um, atmosphere, it'll actually neutralize the atmosphere. You, you put charcoal or... Uh, or some form of natural fiber in there, it's actually going to neutralize the atmosphere, which is one of the things you can do in a post box forge, is drop a piece of charcoal right down to the bottom, and that actually um, neutral that actually absorbs most of the oxygen, creates carbon dioxide, uh, and actually neutralizes your atmosphere for you. So, there you go. Um, <clears throat> so, there you go. Um, <laughs> something else you learned. So, a brick forge, a uh, square forge, is incredibly useful because you can line it with bricks, you can replace uh, portions of the lining without problems, right? Um, this is the one of the main advantages of a brick forge, is if a brick breaks down, you can take that brick out, replace that brick, and you can maintain the rest of the forge's integrity. With this, because you normally have, well, you definitely have to rigidize and line this pale wall with a refractory cement, you have to break out the entire lining once it starts breaking down, which means that this repairing this is a much harder job than repairing this. But building this is slightly easier because normally you have to manufacture your frame for this, whereas this you can just you know fold up a piece of uh, roofing tin, <laughs> as as some people may do. That is exactly why people have coal at the bottom of their propane forge. Exactly right. It neutralizes the atmosphere. So these three are going to be your standard types <coughs> of, um, of forge. 
And they're not really in order of ease. Uh, if they were in order of ease, then I would switch these. Um, because lining something with KO wall is really easy, right? Whereas uh, you have to build a square body for the bricks. Uh, and building this is a massive pain in the butt. Just watch Alex Steele's build for that. Or cut off the top of a helium tank. That's correct. I'm currently watching Monty Python Holy Grail. Well, that's way more important than what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> no one, no one skips Monty Python. Not in this household. Um, all right, so building a brick forge, round forge, or home forge. Either way, lung damage risk. Yeah, to a certain extent, yes. So. If I'm building a square forge, I want to be using the lowest density refractory bricks I can find, which are normally going to be K26. Uh, Isolite K26 are a very good brand. Let's get some evenness in my chalk streaks, shall we? My brick is on things. Okay, so building a square forge. I have my body. I have my walls. Let's say that I'm using four bricks, although this is an unrealistic build because most of the time you're going to use more than four bricks. Let's say I'm building a Kelpie Forge, like uh, Fire Pants Replication Cells. They're awesome, by the way. Um, <clears throat> now, I can mount my burner vertical, right, and have it coming in like that. Or... There are two other ways I can do it. I can mount it canted. Like that, so that the flame is coming in here, creating a vortex. Again, vortexes do work in square forges. Laws of fluid dynamics. Being as they are. But there is a third option, one that I have had uh, told to me by uh, Niels Vandenberg. And then you have a right angle burner, maybe slightly off the floor, not, not quite on the floor. This basically performs the same function as a vertical burner, just you have it to one side. Uh, a lot of the time it's space saving um, rather than anything else. So this is an option. Don't rule this out. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, it is an option. Make sure that you uh, keep that in mind if you've got space issues. Um, if you want to try that out, try that out. Yes, used KO wool is much more dangerous. When you're taking apart an old forge, um, definitely be careful. So, we have our K26 fire bricks, right? We have our canted burner. Let's, let's just make believe I, ha I, can, I have drawing skills. Right, we have our canted burner that's coming down in through here. And it's creating a flame vortex. Right? <clears throat> now, the advantage of a flame vortex in any forge is to even out the heating. But, one thing you have to remember. I just put a piece in there. Where's the vortex going to stop? 
it's going to bounce off this and then it's going to shoot upwards and then it's going to bounce off there and it's going to shoot downwards and it's going to go crazy and you're going to end up with uh, a hit higher heat on the side that the uh, cant is towards. In small square forges, I prefer, personally, um, and this is not shared by all, uh, but this is my personal preference, I prefer a vertical burner. You may choose to disagree with me, I don't care. <laughs> but I prefer a vertical burner, um, it means that I can isolate heats and stuff like that. But if this is also K26, which it should be, you have very low density refractory, which is great. It's reflecting heat. But, if I just grab a pet time tip, but it's also incredibly brittle. <laughs> so, <clears throat> We don't want to put pieces of materials on the K26. So what we want to do is put in a sacrificial forge floor. And this is going to serve multiple purposes. It's going to protect your K26 from damage from your pieces. It's also going to protect your K26 from damage from borax. If you start using forge welding, borax melts stone because it's boric acid. When you heat it up, it becomes boric acid. <coughs> So be very, very careful uh, to have a higher uh, density refractory as your forge lining. And I have actually been converted, and I wasn't before, to painting the surfaces, the inter internal surfaces of your ISO wall, of your, uh, of your isolite bricks, um, <clears throat> with Satanite. Uh, painting them with a layer of satanite, it lowers the um, porosity, mm -hmm. which means that it increases your refractive index because you have no captured heat. Um, and it also protects them slightly. It hardens the surface. So there's something to think about if you're making a brick forge. Brick forges, incredibly useful. I love them uh, very much. The only reason I'm building a round body forge is because I already have ice wall uh, and I'm cheap. <laughs> so do we all understand this there is one main disadvantage to a square body forge can anyone guess what it is I wonder if anyone will guess what the main disadvantage and it has to do with point number four if you were taking notes I doubt anyone's taking notes, but, you know, I can dream. I can dream you guys pay attention to me. Okay. I'm going to draw two side-by-side -side forges. This one's a square body. I'm going to make them 3D. Woo. Getting fancy. Right, we have our square body forge. And now I'm going to try to draw a uh, gas bottle forge. Which is difficult because I'm a terrible artist. This has a forge door down here. <laughs> I I wouldn't advise using cho uh, coal. I would use charcoal. It's green charcoal, right? Point number four: internal chamber construction. 
Mecca's gas. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> now, can anyone tell me what the issue is with this forge over this forge? Got to draw an anvil. Oh, okay. I, I, I'll draw my, my favorite pattern of anvil. German pattern anvil. It's terrible. Aha, you've all got it. Excellent. Sweet. <laughs> it's petting house. Exactly. Correct. Or a coal slot. Okay, so inside these forges, if I now get rid of this. Inside these forges, they're both practically rectangular, so let's draw, that's the square body forge, and here is the piddle shaped, that's your gas tank forge, right? <laughs> Not an idoit. Absolutely, Wiley, I completely agree. <laughs> okay, so, in a square body forge, your lining is normally going to be like that. All right, this is your, uh, so these are your forge walls. Got your burner coming in here. Let's, let's uh, put a burner on both of them. There's a much wider flare on, on the gas tank port. Your lining is going to be like this, right? In a ISO wall lined forge, You're going to have something more akin to this. And if I use an eraser to cut out the doors, much larger door on this side. Um, do the same on this one. This is the last part for this, this lesson. We will probably do another class at some point. So, this is a cross section of our two forges. <laughs> so, here, you can see we have a lip at the top. This is going to serve a very important purpose, because as the heat comes down, as the flame comes down here, much like Newton's second law um, of <laughs> yeah, Newton's laws of physics, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, it's going to hit the forge floor and bounce. And when it bounces, it's going to bounce at angles like this. Right? Same thing's going to happen here. Heat's going down, heat's going out. Right? Can you see the difference already? This one is going to shoot all of that heat straight out the door. This one is going to bounce that heat. It's going to hit here and it's going to bounce down and backwards, funnily enough, because it's hitting the internal curve. Exactly. So you're getting a almost vortex either side of the burner, right? You're getting almost a vortex, not quite a vortex, but you're almost getting a vortex. You'll see it actually, if you look at the forge properly, if you look at the flame, you'll see it licking upwards inside the forge. Now, this can be mitigated by the use. Let's just, uh, let's just true this up a little bit. This can be somewhat mitigated by using forge doors, putting a brick in front of it. Right? You can put a brick in front of the doors, create that vortex, 
and that's going to increase your heat. And when you're doing stuff, um, when you're doing stuff that you can leave inside the forge body, that's actually a very, very good way to do it. And if you don't have to pass the material all the way through, I do recommend blocking off the back, right? Um, or leaving a very, very small opening at the back. You do want some through flow uh, of air because that's actually how, especially in Venturi burners, that's actually how the Venturi works is that it actually gets through, flew through, uh, through flow. You can also do the same to this. But because it's already more thermally efficient, you have to worry less about the doors. Yeah, you need venting. Yeah, you definitely need venting. Uh, you definitely need gapping in your doors, which is why this is always going to shoot more heat out than this. And that's the other reason why a lot of makers use the gas bottle forge, is because it is actually more thermally efficient purely for redirect. Right? It's very hard to make a front lip and that's all it needs. It needs all it needs is a front lip on your gas forge. So if you're building your your uh, your gas forge, if you can add somehow front lips like this, then that's actually going to help you with your thermal efficiency over the doors, right? Because that's what this is providing a function for. So hopefully this was helpful. We've uh, now come to the end of the class. I thank you all for coming. I have been your, uh, your educator, Mr. Towns. Uh, feel free to email me with any further questions, should you have any, on this specific subject. Uh, we may be doing another Forge Theory video in the future, uh, another Forge Theory class, as I should say. Um, I will be putting up a poll in the community tab for the next theory lesson. I might actually start doing uh, one week forging, one week, um, uh, one week uh, theory, if you like that idea. I might put a poll out there uh, for that. But hopefully this helps. I hope you enjoyed listening to me drone on for an hour and 45 minutes about forge theory and thermodynamics. But remember, thermal efficiency most important thing in forges. I expect to see you all at the exam. <laughs> Hope you're all taking notes. Excellent, Broden. I'm glad I could answer your questions. That's what I'm here for. I said I was going to do that video on forge theory. There you go. That's my video on forge theory. <laughs> okay, I'm 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 gonna get a professor <laughs> professor persona. Uh, yeah, no. Hopefully that helped, guys. Um, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed that. I I kind of liked playing the professor for a bit. You know, I enjoy teaching. It's something I've always wanted to do. So. Um, you know, make sure that, uh, you hit that like button on your way out if you're leaving. Um, and yeah, I will be putting a poll in the, um, you can reline it if it's starting to, to, um, fragment and uh, have lots of, uh, fibers come out, then re re reline it completely. Um, replace it completely. Bring an apple next time. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be appreciated, Barnaby. <laughs> That's it. So yeah, I, I really enjoy teaching, so um, this kind of stuff is really fun for me. So I'll put a poll out, put a vote on my community tab. I'll put that out after I jump off the stream. Um, but yeah, no, hopefully that did help. Uh, hopefully you uh, got some of your answers, uh, questions answered. If you didn't, please feel free, as I said, to email me samtownsbladesmith at gmail.com. That's samtownsbladesmith, that's my business name, at gmail.com. Uh, it's all one word. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you have if you have them. So... With that being said, uh, we'll bring cash. Yeah, I'm, I'm always open to bribery. Um, 
Anyway, guys, I'm going to jump off. I've got some work to do, um, but I hope you enjoyed. I will see you next week. Uh, next week's live stream, before you jump off, don't go anywhere. Um, next week's live stream is going to be epic. It's going to be a four-hour live stream, or just over four hours, um, because I was going to be, um, I'm going to be entering a competition. It's a four-hour knife-making competition. We're a start to finish. I'm going to be uh, making a knife in four hours. Uh, and just quickly, before I sh jump off, um, it's a competition to win a couple of things. Um, and I'm going to be using this bar of steel and I'm going to be using the whole bar. So there's going to be some fun stuff going on. I'm doing something stupid again, so come watch me do something stupid next week. Um, yeah, Forge and Fire AU, except it's four hours rather than six. Thanks, Metal Man. <laughs> Thank you so much. But um, yeah, no, definitely check out next week's um, live stream because I'll be doing that and that's going to be fun. Um, so yeah, I hope to see you there. Have a fantastic week. I will have a couple videos out this week. We also have a new Forgecast challenge and it is freaking epic. So make sure you listen to the next episode of the Forgecast coming out this Friday. It's going to be amazing. I am super excited. It was one of the best episodes we've had in a long time. Uh, me and Alex had a bunch of fun. We laughed so much. Um, I was super excited um, for this episode, so make sure you listen to this week's episode of the Forgecast when it comes out on Friday. Um, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm actually giddy with excitement. It's going to be fun. So make sure you're watching that. Make sure you're listening to the Forgecast. I am going to see you next time. Have a good one.